Good morning, church, and welcome to another Sunday of worship. This Sunday is the second Sunday of Advent, a Sunday where we wait and prepare for our Lord and Savior. Let's read from Isaiah 40, 3 through 5. In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And let's read from Genesis three fourteen through 15. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. And he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Let's hear that again, because from the very beginning, God said to the enemy, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. You see, God had a plan for our redemption already. It was put in motion the moment humanity strayed. And so we wait, knowing that the one who fulfills all prophecy is coming. Let's worship the Lord together. Yeah. 
dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless stand before the throne. I saw this woman absolutely lose it in a restaurant recently because she was having to wait for her food longer than she thought was acceptable. While that very night, hundreds of millions of people around the world would go to bed hungry. We live in a world where people get angry about things that do not matter. While at the same time, people don't get angry about things that do matter. Go to a game and watch the way that people behave. You know that guy, the one who gets really angry with the referee? I don't think his anger has that much to do with the ref. He's, he hasn't given his life to a bigger cause, a larger fight. He was made to give his life to something bigger, something more beautiful, something that helps make the world a better place, and he's wasting it, and he knows it, even if he wouldn't say it that way. So he goes to the game, and he shouts, and he boos, and his face turns red, and he gets all upset with the referee, but the truth is, some people are looking for a fight because they aren't in one. The people I know who are most engaged with the suffering of the world, the people I know who have given themselves to big, beautiful, healing kinds of causes, they're, they're generally free from that irrational, petty kind of anger. They don't fall into the trap of that low-grade rage that actually increases the brokenness of the world. Are you one of those people? Or maybe, actually, maybe we should ask your friends, or your husband, or your wife, or your boyfriend, or your girlfriend, or your coworkers. We should ask your kids, because they'll tell us, because they know. If you're one of those people, the question is, some people say, well, you know, I just have a temper. No, no, no. You have things going on inside of you that you aren't dealing with. Good morning, church. This is Pastor Steve. I hope you enjoyed your Thanksgiving holiday. I know I did. Uh, I spent several days with my family. It was truly a blessing. But I missed the church. Uh, I missed my time uh, with you last week. I look forward to getting back into the Word with you this morning. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5 this morning, beginning in verse 17. So open your Bibles with me to Matthew 5, beginning in verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was uh, said to the people long ago, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, which is, uh, is unanswerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and reconcile to your brother then come and offer your gift. It has been said the Bible is like a gold mine for the soul, and the teachings of Jesus are surely the motherload of its grace and truth. When Jesus gave the Great Commission in Matthew 28, he gave the outline of what it means to be a disciple. Now, according to Jesus, we are not his disciples unless we are are obeying and living in his word. How can we be disciples, Christians, except through belief in him? How can we say we believe in him if we're not careful to hear what he said and what he taught? 
and seek to obey those things. What church has a statement of faith or teaching that says they are doing all that Christ has commanded? In Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, Jesus said to make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to obey, to obey everything he commanded. Now, the Great Commission not only deals with baptism, it focuses on discipleship and teaching disciples to obey whatever Jesus commanded and taught. If we have a Bible, we all have the words and teachings of Jesus. So, are we not really without excuse? If we take our faith seriously, instead of thinking we're saved simply by believing, should we not obey Jesus' command, Jesus' commandments, his teachings, his truth. Many times the Sermon on the Mount is referred to as Jesus' basic teachings in a capsule. So this morning we we'll continue in this series on the teachings of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 24. Specifically his teachings about his teaching about anger. But first, I want to briefly share Jesus' teaching about the law. Some of those in the crowd were experts at telling others what to do when it came to the laws of God, but they missed the central point of his laws themselves. Jesus made it very clear that obeying God's law is more important than explaining it. The Pharisees, their weakness was that they were content to obey the laws outwardly without allowing God to change their hearts or change their attitudes. God judges our hearts as well as our deeds, for it is in the heart that our real allegiance, allegiance lies. How are you doing at obeying God yourself? God's moral and ceremonial laws were given to help people love God with all their hearts and minds. But throughout Israel's history, these laws had been misquoted and misapplied in their lives. By the time of Jesus, religious leaders had turned the laws into a confusing mass of rules and then much more. Jesus was trying to bring people back to the, the law's original purpose. He did not speak against the law itself, but against uh, abuses and excesses to which the law had been subjected. So, if Jesus did not come to abolish the law, does that mean all the Old Testament laws still apply today? Good question. In the Old Testament, there are three categories of law. Ceremonial, civil, and moral. So let's look at those briefly. Ceremonial law related specifically to Israel's uh, worship. Its primary purpose was to point forward to Jesus Christ. These laws are no longer necessary since Jesus' death and resurrection, but the principles behind them to worship and love a holy God still apply in our lives. The civil law applied to daily living in Israel. Now, due to massive society and cultural changes over the centuries, all these guidelines cannot be followed specifically. But the principles behind the commands are timeless and should guide our conduct in our life today. The moral law, such as the Ten Commandments, is the direct command of God, and it requires strict obedience. Moral law reveals the nature and will of God, and it still applies today in the 21st century. Jesus obeyed the moral law completely. And after a brief review and teaching of the law, Jesus steps into the teaching of anger. Have you ever been angry? Anger is a reality in our daily lives, so much so that, let me tell you a story, a true story. In the spring of 1894, the Baltimore Orioles baseball team traveled to Boston to play a routine game. But what happened that day was anything but routine. McGraw, playing with the Baltimore Orioles, got into a fight with Tommy Tucker of the Boston Bean Eaters during a game at the South End Grounds in Boston. Tucker and McGraw were involved in a play at third, third base. McGraw, he lost his temper, he got angry, and the fight was on. Before you knew it, the anger spread, and within minutes, all the players had joined in on the fight on the field. 
Then the tension begins to spread into the stands. Now, as the anger spread like fire, literally, in fact, a fire somehow started in the outfield stands that made its way towards the stands behind home plate and eventually destroyed the stadium. Not only that, the fire spread and damaged over 100 adjacent buildings near the ballpark. Because of one man's anger, a portion of a town was destroyed. And to think it all started with a small altercation at third base on a baseball field. When asked later, John McGraw couldn't even remember why he got angry. Yet the damage from his anger spread and just about destroyed a community. God knows the destructive power of anger, and his word warns us uh, to control it. If only McGraw had kept himself under control. And if we only would not unleash our anger on our family, friends, or co-workers. If only we would control our anger. If only we would take seriously the commands and teachings of Jesus. Our ways are not God's ways. And we need to change from being slaves to sin to being servants of God. We need to die to anger and rise to patience in this life. So how can we die to anger? Count to ten? Hold our breath? Bite our tongue? No, we've got to go much deeper than that. We need to allow God's word to radi do radical surgery in our lives as we seek to live new lives with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Master, our Teacher. <coughs> so beginning in this passage in Matthew chapter 5, which lies at the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus unfolds his expectations concerning righteous, righteousness within the kingdom. First, right relationships with man. And we see that in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 48. But also a right relationship with God in chapter 6, verses 1 through 34. Jesus presents six teachings which can stand as an ex uh, examples of true righteousness. Again, Jesus is raising the bar from law to grace. Jesus' teaching deepens the commandments by stressing the inner dimensions of God's will, the intentions of God, when, of, of God's law and of his commands. As a disciple begins to practice what Jesus teaches, he or she will find their righteousness will exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. Now, understand, anger affects our relationship with fellow man, and we see that in verses 21 through 22. I want to take you back to verse 20. In verse 20, Jesus, as he sat on the mountainside just outside of Capernaum, he told the crowd that their righteousness had to surpass the righteousness uh, of the religious leaders of the day, which were the Pharisees. And as, he, as he was sitting there and he, he began to teach, he said, you guys know the law. You know what it says. You shall not murder. You shall not kill. The religious leaders were in conformity with the letter of the law, but still couldn't grasp the spirit of the law. In verse 7, in verse 17 of our text, Jesus had just told those in the crowd that he had come not to, to abolish or destroy the written law, but that he had come to accomplish its purpose. He had come so that man could understand the spirit of the law as well as the letter of the law. I don't know if you remember uh, Clarence Darrow. He was a famous criminal lawyer. He once joked, everyone is a potential murderer. I have not murdered anyone, but I frequently get, a, get satisfaction out of obituary notices. A little humor there, but uh, after specifying God's standard of holiness in verse 20, Jesus now applies this standard attacking self-righteousness by charging that no one is truly innocent of murder. The anger that lies behind murder Anger, which many people think is not really sin, is a sin. 
Yes, all our emotions are given to us by God. We love, we get angry, we're sad, we're happy, we laugh, we cry. All these emotions and feelings make, uh, make us who we are as human, being, human beings. The dividing line in whether our emotions are righteous or unrighteous righteous depends on how we handle uh, them or how they handle us. There's a right anger and there's a wrong anger. The law prohibited the, the act of murder. And Jesus deals with the thoughts and motives that lead to that act. Do you know the uh, old rhyme, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never harm me? Jesus is saying that not only will murder harm people, our thoughts and words will also harm people. If you call someone an idiot or curse at them, then you are guilty of sin and you're no different than a murderer. Now, you may be thinking, oh, well, wait a minute, Steve. You say just because I get mad at someone and call them names, I'm just as bad as a murderer. No, I'm not saying that. Jesus is saying that. When we point the finger at people's character with name-calling, slanderous remarks, when we publicly ridicule and make fun of them or call them stupid or dumb or empty-headed, we're doing permanent harm to that person. Jesus is saying the motivations of the heart are more important than appearance. When our motive is to hurt, destroy, or exclude others, we share the same motive with the one uh, who murders or kills. When addressing this anger, Jesus lifts the bar from the code book to the heart. When we get angry with someone, our relationship with that person is damaged. That is a direct conflict with the command of Jesus to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus could have begun his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount with any, with any issue or topic he wanted. But he chose to begin with the sixth commandment from Exodus uh, chapter 20, verse 13. You shall not murder. This commandment is the first law of social life, life within the confines of relationship. When we harbor ang anger and ill will in our hearts, we cannot possibly fulfill the final command given by Christ in Matthew 28, the Great Commission of sharing the gospel and making disciples. Anger affects our relationship with fellow man. Anger also affects our relationship with God in verses 23 and 24 of our text. In Jesus' day, people would come to the temple and they would bring an animal to sacrifice on the altar as an act of worship to God. Jesus' teaching is this. Until you get yourself in a right relationship with your fellow man, you cannot truly worship God. Broken relationships can hinder our relationship with God. Did we realize that? If we have a grievance with a person, we should resolve that pro problem as soon as possible. We're hypocrites if we claim to love God while we hate others or while we're angry at others. Your attitude towards others reflect your relationship with God. This is one of those hard teachings of Jesus. If you're in conflict with someone, do not come to worship until you have attempted to resolve that conflict or that issue with that person. God wants all of you when you come to worship him. You cannot do that when, you're in conf when there's a conflict between you and someone else. Your worship becomes divided because of a heart issue. These conflicts put us out of the will of God. Let me take you to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 11 through 16. Let me read those. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is, incense is detestable to me. New moon, Sabbath, and convocations. I cannot bear your evil assemblies. 
your new moon festivals and your appointed feast my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. God was unhappy with their sacrifices and their worship. They had come to place more faith in the rituals of the religion than in, in, than in the God they worshipped. It was all about how things were done, not about a relationship with God. The people of Jesus' day made sacrifices, offered prayers, they tithed, they carried on religious activities of every kind, but it was all heartless external ceremony rituals. Our worship must be pure. Anger and unsolved issues keep us out of fellowship with God. It damages our worship in time with God. One of the greatest dangers in the instruction and teachings of, of children and new believers in Christ is to focus on external obedience while neglecting heartfelt devotion. When we neglect the heart in instruction and teaching, especially teaching about honoring God, we are training up little Pharisees. This is why so many young people show little interest in the things of faith once they leave the home. Parents who spend all their time focusing on external ritual obedience find out much too late they neglected the essence of proper worship and heartfelt devotion. Let me just say, yes, you may have raised your children in the church, but did you raise them in Christ Jesus? And there is a big difference. The Pharisees thought they were righteous because they did not commit the act of murder. On the mountainside, Jesus said, unless your right righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. If we are harboring anger, we're hurting ourselves and we're hurting others. We're putting ourselves at odds with God. Jesus' teaching is not to be taken as an idle statement. And, you know, sometimes I, I think we look at Jesus' teaching as that, just words. There is a warning for those who have improper, unrighteous, wrong anger within their heart. If we have anger within us, we, according to God's Son, Jesus Christ, in his teaching, we will be in danger of the fire of hell. Don't let your anger and conflicts linger in, uh, around in your heart. When we let anger hang around, we never know what can happen. Has your anger caused you to have strained relationships in your life? Look around you. Is anger and unresolved conflict interfering with your worship? Great question. Is anger in the way of, of you having, uh, is it getting in the way of you having a life of, of meaning relation, meaningful relationships? Not only with other uh, people, but with God himself? This morning, you can leave them here at the altar and go and reconcile with the one that you're angry with. Jesus spoke with clarity. He was very clear. It's clear that Jesus taught the law and the prophets hang upon two commands. You shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second, he said, is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. In the Gospels, we find the things Jesus said and did were according to the law and the prophets. Let me close with this passage in Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6. 
Verses 6 through 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with the thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Listen. To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. We find in the teachings of Jesus all of these elements and more. He tells us what's good. He tells us that justice includes judging righteously and not according to appearance but according to truth given by God. He shows us what loving mercy is. He shows us humility that we need to imitate. Even if we cannot fully uh, attain his uh, stature because we're just men, women, made up of dust of the earth. God is mindful of this. Yet he loved us by sending his only begotten son that we might be blessed to reach out to his example to follow. If we understand that he counted equality with God as not a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, Jesus, to be made into the form of man, destined to die upon the cross to save us by redeeming our souls with his own blood. How can we but look at this uh, unequaled love with anything but awe of respect and humility? So I'm urging you to take your Bible as we continue this series on the teachings of Jesus. Open it up. Look into his words of eternal life and consider if you're truly a disciple of, of Jesus. Jesus called them disciples, students, and followers of him. This is the first Sunday of December. It's a time that we observe the Lord's Supper. This morning, I urge you to be prepared to receive the cup and the bread as we remember God is Almighty Self becomes man, dies on the cross for you, for me, for all mankind to restore us into a relationship with Him. He loves us so much. So, I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 in the Lord's Supper. For I see from the Lord what I also pass on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was portrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread represents the body of Christ. In the word of the Lord, we continue. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant and in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, what a blessed day this is, that we can gather, open up your word, as your Holy Spirit speaks to us. As we received the bread.
bread and the cup. May we be mindful of the mighty work, the sacrificial work of Christ on the cross for all mankind that sent him to his death so that our sins may be forgiven. To unite us, connect us with our almighty God, creator of all things. And may our hearts have been touched by your teachings this morning as Jesus shared truth with us concerning our anger. May our hearts be pure. May the Holy Spirit continue to guide and direct, rebuke us into understanding all truth that's laid before us. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the opportunity of fellowshipping with other believers in Christ Jesus. And may this day, these moments that we have shared, been pleasing to you. May we all rejoice as we rejoice in your grace, your mercy, and the love that you have for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Great to be been back with you this week. I look forward to continuing this series of messages on the teachings of Jesus. Walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Open up his word. Learn from the great teacher himself. And I'll see you next week. I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me working all things out you're working all things out and yes i will lift you high in the lowest valley yes i will bless your name oh yes i will sing for joy when my heart is heavy fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out you're working all